turn you over to Margie, who's going to introduce our wonderful speaker uh, from Australia. Okay, Margie. Good evening, everybody. Tim, are you there? I'd like to see your face, Tim, so I can okay. introduce oh. you. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I'm Margie Haas, Program Director, and I am thrilled to introduce you all to Tim Lowe from Brisbane, Australia. Um, he will be talking about where song began, how Australian birds took over the world. So Tim is highly regarded as a biologist and a writer. He's the prize winning author of a number of books, including Feral Future and The New Nature, both published by Penguin and Wild Food Plants of Australia. He's the current co-editor of Wildlife Australia magazine, to which he's been a long-term contributor. He also works as an environmental consultant and his reports, books, articles, and talks have contributed to ecological thought and environmental policy in Australia, and I'm sure much more widely. Uh, his seventh and most recent book, Where Song Began, uh, Australia's Birds and How They Changed the World, published by Yale University Press, became the first nature book ever to win uh, the Australian Book Industry Awards Prize for Best General Nonfiction in 2015. I uh, highly recommend this book. It's really fascinating. That's how I, um, I, I read this book. And I also read an article by Tim in Birding in um, November, 2021, where he talks about the same subject. He wrote the article and that's actually how I found Tim for us all tonight. Um, so before we start, I just want to say that I owe everybody an apology. Um, I and I, including Tim, because I stuck the word dinosaur into the title of his talk tonight, which he said, Mark, I'm not really talking about dinosaurs, although I'm sure they're in the background there. So, but um I, I just thought it sounded a little more sexy. I, I have this thing about bird dinosaurs. So if anybody can ever think of an interesting bird dinosaur speaker, I, I don't want to outshine uh, Tim by any means. So uh, I'm just always trying to find bird dinosaur speakers as well. Anyway, Tim, enough of all that. I'm so thrilled you're with us all the way from Brisbane. Thank you very much for doing this. Take it away. Thank you, Amagi. Um, uh, okay, so have you got my first slide up? We're functioning. Yep. Yeah, okay. Looks good. looks good. Okay. So, um, oh dear. I'm not getting the um, jar. I just got to backtrack. Okay. okay, so we did our trial and it worked really well, but I think I. Um, uh, Technology, it's always something. Yeah, okay. Make it slow. Yep. Okay, Have you, are you with me? You need to share screen. Okay, we're getting there. Everything. There you go. Okay. I just can't get there. You know. There. It's on the. Oh, it's. Sorry if, about this. If we, you hit slideshow and play, hopefully play from start, then hopefully we'll get there. Yeah. Okay, we're working now. I think. There we go. Okay. Yep. Okay, so um, there was my talk. Oh, just forget the last minute. This was my um, back of my backyard. I just moved house last year. <clears throat> this was my backyard. Looked like thanks to a brush turkey that um, scratched up a breeding mound. So I'm sure you all know about how these birds, which are only found in Australia and islands, 
um, in the Pacific further north or a range of these uh, megapodes, they use the heat of fermentation to um, hatch their eggs. And so if I dig my arm right down, it's quite warm inside. Um, I didn't mind the mound up in the backyard, but they've got really long claws and they just ripped up all the lawn over half my backyard. And I know there was a book written about the birds of Brisbane in 1963 saying, there's still a few of these left way out in the most remote rainforests on the outskirts of Brisbane. And since then, they've just totally invaded the city. So people don't shoot birds um, and they've realised that um, people are highly tolerant. The chicks can fly from births. I've had them come inside my house and jump out the window and fly off. Um, but it's an example of how um, Australia has got some pretty weird birds. Another example, I mean, our, our magpies, they're just notorious for um, their attacks on people. So that little girl up on the top left, pecked in the eye in hospital. I read about her in a news article saying she might lose the sight in her eye. I couldn't find out whether she did or not. There weren't any follow-up articles. But the boy on the other side, he did lose his sight from a magpie attack in the town of Toowoomba. But they didn't, they didn't kill the magpie. They caught it and took it out into the bush and let it go away from people. There's a lot of tolerance. And that bicycle helmet <clears throat> you see at the bottom, it's um, what I usually see around Brisbane. And bicycle helmets have these kind of plasticky prongs to um, discourage um, uh, uh, bird, birds from actually striking the cyclist on their eyes or the ears drawing blood. Um, but yeah, we have um, really in your face birds and literally in that case. Now, when I was growing up as a kid, we had this sense of our wildlife was weird and you know, particularly with the marsupials and the platypus, this mammal with a duck's bill that laid eggs. The idea that Australia was very primitive, it was backward, it was quirky, it was weird. You couldn't really understand it except through the idea that it was very primitive. So this, it was almost like when God was creating species early on, his first examples, they were really badly constructed and he stuck them in a closet and Australia was that closet. And so for me as a, as a young naturalist, this was very dissatisfying. It was sort of embarrassing. You know, we had these primitive um, very unworthy animals. They weren't majestic like the bison and deer in the Northern Hemisphere. And the birds were part of this kind of storytelling. So we had the, um, <clears throat> um, the cowbirds building their weird mounds. There's nothing primitive about these displays, but they're certainly strange, certainly seem sort of eccentric and quirky. So they fitted the eye. You know, you could sort of fit them in with the platypus as something that wasn't quite right. I mean, the black swan was an interesting one because if you go back to Roman times, there was a saying that you, you couldn't have a black swan. A black swan was impossible. It's like saying pigs could fly, purple cows. And um, so when black swans were discovered in Australia, that was seen as evidence that Australia was very strange. But really in hindsight, if you're a big black water bird sitting on mud at the edge of a lake and the mud is dark, black is quite a, quite a sensible colour. I had the lyre bird, which, I mean, you could say, well, it looks like a pheasant, so it's no big deal in that sense. But it's a songbird, you know, like this is a songbird that is looking like a pheasant. And then the, um, the bird pollinated flowers, they were also part of this weirdness about Australia. So if you look at that banks here, that flower head, it's, it's very stiff. Um, Aboriginal women used to use those dried flower heads as brushes. Now, you can't imagine using any American flower as a brush. Um, and so uh, it's bird pollinator, but it looks nothing like a hummingbird flower where you get a little red tube. And you can see these Australian style open brushy flowers in Florida with your melaleucas and your eucalypts that they're very, very different from the normal bird flowers you otherwise see around the world. Now, I was very pleased to be able to write this book because in a sense, you know, I had this burden from childhood, the idea that we had these embarrassing wildlife that you couldn't really make sense of it and that realising that you could actually, um, <clears throat> well, these days, uh, look at our birds, look at our mammals and come up with you know, quite sensible explanations for why they should be different. And as it comes down to geography, Australia is the one continent that 
hasn't been connected, well, plus Antarctica, hasn't been connected to other continents for a very long time. And I'm sure you'd realise that you've only got to go back 20,000 years and you had um, Alaska joined up to Northern Asia. So Australia has never, never been joined on to Asia. So it's certainly evolved in its own way. But also the theories of continental drift really change the thinking. And so you can see I've listed there all the, the paleonase, the ratites, plus the tinamous, this group of birds that are all related to each other and that are all in the southern hemisphere. And so you could draw the conclusion that there was uh, a lot of bird evolution going on in the southern hemisphere and they are telling us about that. And so that when you see something really bizarre like the cassowaries in Australia where um, these are serious urban birds in North Queensland. So um, uh, if you look at the other very large birds like ostriches, emus, rears, they're open country birds. So they're um, you know, out on plains, out in open woodlands. Um, they're very much fleeing from you if they see you. Cassowaries, they're skulking in the rainforest. And this means that um, through this skulking behaviour, they'll wander into gardens close to rainforest and people feed them, give them water. It's against the law. They do it anyway. Um, and they're dangerous. Um, there's only been one death in Australia, um, quite a lot in um, New Guinea. The people have been kicked in the chest and sent to hospital. And so you can see these guys dressed up in a pretty heavy duty way to rescue a young cassowary. This was after a cyclone when all the fruit from the rainforest had been stripped off. And this young bird was, um, it was starving. It was actually very weak. It couldn't, couldn't do any harm, but the normal routine when you're rescuing any kind of cassowary is to really um, dress up expecting war and violence. Um, and these are birds that'll smash up your car. Um, so they'll, they'll, they can kill you, they can smash up your car, they'll fall into swimming pools, they wander into sheds, um, they'll steal your tomatoes. It's quite, quite something to live with them and they do make Australia unusual. Um, and they were, and there were, you know, this whole issue of geography and Gondwana and how they evolved. I mean, the early theories was all about making all birds come out of the Northern Hemisphere. So here's an article from 1949 where an Australian geographer was giving the potential pathways to explain how emus um, and cassowaries reached Australia. And for some reason, it's got them coming out of the vicinity of New York. But it's very much a northern origin and consistent with the thinking of that time. And this really went back to William Diller Matthew, this um, very prominent paleontologist who published this paper in 1911. It was a huge paper, mainly about mammals. But you know, the idea at this time was very much about um, uh, centers of origin. I mean, it's very um, Old Testament. The, um, um, a place where everything comes from. And what he actually says, I mean, this is a journal article about biology, but his first picture was of humans. And what he wrote in the text was that the Chinese are always invaded from the West, the Indians are always invaded from the North, Europe, they have hordes galloping in from the West, therefore humans originated in Central Asia and just pumped out, and this was true of all animals and plants. Now, of course, we know this is complete nonsense, but um, people wanted theories because you've got far more land in the Northern Hemisphere than in the South. It was very easy to believe that that's where species had come from. And of course, European civilization, North American culture, these were the important parts of the world. So you know, it was nice to think that that's where everything came from. Now, uh, it was... Um, continental drift that got people thinking, well, maybe this isn't true. Um, maybe look at the southern distribution of these ratites. This is evidence of southern origin for these birds. But it's not as simple as using distributions. You've really got to look at the fossil record. When you do that, you can find that there were actually ostrich relatives living in North America 50 million years ago. And so the fossil record <clears throat> doesn't necessarily reinforce this picture of southern distributions. And so then there's been this thinking that, well, 
in the Northern Hemisphere, we had the huge ice ages. They um, had a terrible impact on um, the forests in the Northern Hemisphere. So <clears throat> if you go back 20 million years, Europe, Europe was lush. It had trogons, it had parrots. Um, it's possible that Northern Hemisphere was actually where everything started. It got pushed, it traveled down to the south, and then it disappeared from the north because of a harsher climate. And the ice ages are much worse in the Northern Hemisphere just because you've got more land. You've got more land, ice can form on land. In the Southern Hemisphere, the ocean currents are moving equatorial water south. So, you know, we, Australia was nowhere near as cold as equivalent areas in the north during an ice age. So, um, in fact, these ratites, I don't think they are legitimate evidence of southern origins. And so you can go through the fossil record. Europe's got the best fossil record. And so it's been easy for them to argue against the idea of southern origins. So Hwartzen, you know, classic bird of the Amazon, fossils found in France, Hwartzen fossils in France, and then mouse birds, classic African birds, Africa, Gondwanan continent, but mouse bird fossils have been found in New Mexico. Um, so you get this contradiction between current distributions telling you that there are all these southern bird groups, but the fossils saying, hold on, um, they were in the north in the past, so we can't be sure about that. And, um, and so it, it applies as well to lungfish. I mean, lungfish, classic, three southern continents, lots of lungfish fossils in Europe. And so, yeah, it's these really key points about um, distributions implying southern origins, fossils implying northern origins. And when DNA methods became the main way to assess bird relationships, they would always point to southern origins because you weren't getting DNA out of 20 million year old fossils. And so um, I'm saying um, I'm going to talk about birds coming out of Australia. It's a, title of my talk, but what I'm doing first is saying, well, let's be careful about the basis of the evidence because some people I think have gone too far. <clears throat> so waterfowl, if you look at the, um, the waterfowl, in the Southern Hemisphere, there are three families of waterfowl. The magpie goose in Australia, it's got a family all its own. So it's called a goose, but the geese you have in the Northern Hemisphere, they are much more closely related to ducks and swans than they are to the geese. In, in South America, you've got the screamers, only found in South America. They're all other water birds, all other ducks, swans and geese found all over the world. They're all in one family. So three families in the Southern Hemisphere, one family um, everywhere else. But the fossils are really, really confusing. So not sure. And similarly with the um, game birds. So the megapodes, like the brush turkey in my garden, um, that it comes out as the oldest family of game birds, but the fossil record is really messy. So let's stay away from that. But where it's on really, really safe ground is when you talk about the songbirds, when you talk about the perching birds, there is no doubt in the mind of any evolutionary ornithologist that all of the North American songbirds, they had an ancestor that came out of Australia. This is, this is really solid science. And this is my favourite slide for showing this because in 2018, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology invited me over, flew, flew me over to give a talk, talk to the students there. And this was how they advertised my talk, how Australia's birds populated the world. Now, you would not have America's leading ornithological institute allowing a title like that if it wasn't really settled science. And there you can see, there is now a scientific consensus. I mean, I wrote that, but they, they didn't, um, you know, they were happy, happy to publish it. So this, this is the really solid stuff. Now we know it um, <clears throat> originally because of the DNA methods, um, but they're backed up by fossils. So that's what makes it different from the earlier examples that I talked about. So it was Charles Sibley, this brilliant American who was doing this early, um, very, very early DNA work in the 1980s. What he was doing was you'd get the DNA of two birds and actually boil it up. And you know that the DNA, you get these two strands coiled up. You can see the coils <clears throat> on that bottom picture. He'd boil up the DNA 
and strands would come apart and you'd cool it down and then they would rejoin and birds that were very closely related you would get a lot of hybrid DNA so not DNA from two different species would it would be willing to join together because it was so similar and so he used this as very um, very clever he used this to work out what trees were very closely related and the way you get a phylogenetic tree is you start with the birds that are very, very close, you put them together, and then the birds that are increasingly dissimilar becomes a lower branch and lower branch, and you construct these trees. And what's really striking about the tree on the right, it's quite hard to see it here, but right pretty much in the middle, he's got a super order where he's grouped together a lot of northern hemisphere birds, particularly crows, shrikes, nutcrackers, jays, He's got them in with all these Australian birds. And here's a Scientific American article from 1986 where he interpreted what had happened. So he was still committed to the idea that birds had originally started off in the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, you've got Archaeopteryx, world's oldest um, bird fossil, you can call that a dinosaur, Maggie. So there's the dinosaur in my talk. So that had come from Germany, so yes, best evidence was that birds had originated in the Northern Hemisphere. But if you look at his um, <clears throat> red arrow, he had an early bird coming into Australia and then evolving into this group of birds that came out and then gave the world crows, ravens, jays, magpies, shrikes. And this was really radical stuff. People hated it. But then um, DNA methods got much better. So Sibley's methods, they did had a lot of mistakes. If you come forward to the beginning of the um, 21st century, you've got these um, huge international DNA teams, so a mixture of Americans, Europeans, Australians, pumping out papers like this, and they're all converging on this conclusion of a Gondwanan origin for passerine birds. And no one was able to come up with any papers that weren't showing this result. So um, that's why you can pretty well call it consensus science. And see, um, this is just sort of one uh, representative phylogenetic tree. When you do these trees, uh, they only sample a, um, a subset of birds. And you get always get this pattern out of the very lowest branch. I mean, the thing to remember about perching birds is that songbirds and perching birds are not the same thing. So um, if you look in, North American Field Guide. I mean, I've got the um, old National Geographic Guide. But at the beginning of the perching birds, you've got the flycatchers, phoebes, kiskadees, kingbirds. These are perching birds, but they are not songbirds. They don't learn their songs. Now, if you look at this phylogenetic tree, they are represented there by the second lowest branch, the word pitta, that groups them in there. Below, so this group, you're probably aware, is, is mainly centered in South America. So huge numbers of um, uh, uh, fly, the flycatcher group in South America. The very bottom branch are the New Zealand wren. So this is a tiny, nearly extinct group of birds only in New Zealand, so a Gondwanan landmass. Then you get a group that's mainly in South America. Then when you get to the true songbirds, this lowest branch manure, that is Australian lyrebirds and Australian scrub birds, and then the next couple of branches, or well, the next several branches, are all Australian. And then all of the international songbirds, all of the North American, European, Asian songbirds, they're all much higher up the tree. So this is, um, this is the evidence that um, has been very, uh, very, very influential. It also fits the fossil evidence. So Australia's been able to claim the fossils of the world's oldest songbirds. And we have this fossil site at Riversley in northwest Queensland, <clears throat> the oldest layers are Miocene in age, and they picked up about 20 million year old lyrebirds, tree creepers, log runners, citalis, bristle birds. These are all birds on those lower branches. And the ages on these, they're 20 million years old. You could find songbirds in Europe at that time, uh, songbirds in, um, uh, I think it's a Namibian or Kenyan website, but they're, they're ex early extinct groups. So if you go back 20 million years in time and say what genera of songbird, what, you know, what, what songbirds could you see anywhere in the world that you could recognise today, it would only be in Australia. And then 
there's anatomical evidence as well. So there are really three strings to the Australian songbird bow, the genetics, the fossils, and the anatomy. So there's this American, Peter Amys, um, had a weird obsession with the sirens as the voice song boxes of birds. And so he dissected. I just can't imagine, you know, as a bird lover spending all my time indoors dissecting um, dead birds, cutting them open. But he was just fell off his chair when he cut open the, the voice box of a, uh, a tree creeper. So this is an Australian tree creeper, seven species. And you've got that middle design, which doesn't exist in any other kind of songbird. Um, and so there's a first design you can see on the left <clears throat> that's only in lyrebirds and scrub birds on that first branch of the songbird tree. So you can go first branch, second branch of the DNA tree, and the third branch is all other songbirds. So here in Australia, we've got these three designs of voice box, only one outside Australia. And the odd thing is that the lyrebirds have that first design. I mean, they're regarded as the world's best singers. So it's a great design, but it, it didn't take off. I don't, I don't think there was anything about Syrinx design that explains why it was that third group that spread around the world uh, and that it is just more evidence that um, songbirds originated in Australia and that there's much greater anatomical diversity in our songbirds than you can see outside. And so, yeah, just coming back to show you that phylogenetic tree that you really are looking at Minura first song syrinx design, Climacta second design, all the birds above that have that third design. Uh, and so, you know, you really get to this question. If we think about song, I mean, there's a lot of debate about um, can bird song be considered genuine song? I'm sure if a poll was taken among bird watchers, we'd all say, yes, yes, songbirds sing, songbirds sing, definitely. So if that's the case, um, then songbirds were singing the first songs back in the Myers in 20, 20, 30 million years ago, and that the first songs were being heard in Australia. You know, if you were a Martian vessel visiting Australia 20 million years ago, the most intelligent animals you would have found would have been birds in Australia. And if you look at um, the rise of uh, the great apes and monkeys, they are younger than the really smart song songbirds. And so when we get back to this question of why is there so much diversity of behaviour in Australia, I think there are really two reasons. One is that um, they've been here so much longer that the diversity is so much greater. And, you know, that syrinx design is also reflected in a high diversity of behaviours. So this is a bowbird out in the desert, which I particularly like using bits of broken glass and crockery and bones and plastic to impress females. Um, and the second reason is that uh, we don't have the cold winters. So, um, and of course, Florida is like Australia in that category. But, you know, you do know that if you, say, look at bird behaviour in the northern half of North America or in northern Europe, I mean, it's northern Europe where ornithology really developed as a science. And with those cold winters, that really does constrain um, bird behaviour if birds are obliged to migrate for, um, migrate south during winter time, that's a really handicap in terms of complicated behavioural patterns. So I mean, if you look at, say, group breeding that you'll get in, your, say, your Florida jays, that, that kind of behaviour is much more likely to happen where there's a warmer climate. And so, yeah, I don't really understand why. I mean, a magpie does seem to be the world's most aggressive bird. I've got these mags, magpie signs just outside. I can walk up to a window a few metres away and look out and see swooping signs. Interesting thing is that local magpies here, they're only attacking children, not adults. So my next door neighbour with kids, the kids would carry a stick while they're walking around, but um, I don't have to do that. And yeah, I mean, it's a real cultural thing that um, you have websites letting you know, does your park in spring have aggressive magpies? It's not a year round thing. So every spring you go, oh, I just nearly got hit on the head. That was a magpie. And then you uh, pick up a stick or look around to see whether it's going to be one of the really nasty ones. <laughs> the interesting thing is that they, they do come out in popularity polls as one of our um, 
well, in some years as Australia's favourite bird. Um, and it's, it's actually quite easy to understand why, in that they are just so bold and fearless. People love feeding them meat and they really swagger. So I, had, I actually had one a few um, days ago. I was walking past the front door and there's a magpie. Actually, I could see it through the glass door. It was a young one. It was obvious that someone around here is feeding magpies and it was checking me out to see if I would feed it. So I opened the front door to see if it would walk in. It just kind of looked at me and I didn't have any meat, so it lost interest. But, yeah, people, people love that, that really bold, sassy behaviour. Um, you know, something else we uh, lead the world in, apart from violence, is, is promiscuity. So now, now that you can do DNA tests of paternity, there's a study in Western Australia found that in the magpie nests in Perth, 82% of the nests, the father that was bringing up the chicks, it wasn't actually the father of those birds. Um, but you, you're not meant to feel sorry for that father because he was just the father of the chicks in some other nest. So we know that in um, fairy wrens where the levels of promiscuity or infidelity are even higher than that, that they have such stable social systems that you'll have a pair of birds and a lot of their younger birds, their helpers. And if the mother or father dies, one of the daughters or sons will move in and take over. So it's very important that you do have infidelity in that case, or you would actually have matings between the mother and the father. And this very um, stable sort of group system, it is to do with a fairly stable climate. And so young birds, they're learning breeding skills. It, it's more in their interest to hang around at home and wait for a vacancy than to disperse away and not, not find a breeding opportunity. So um, this is our explanation for why we've got these amazingly unfaithful birds. And, and nectar birds are really, really unusual. I mean, if you look at, um, okay, obviously in the Americas, it's hummingbirds are the main nectar birds. Then in Asia, Africa, it's some um, sunbirds. And these are little birds, little bee bills. We have these gigantic honey ears, and it really does reflect the, the plants. So we have um, you know, dominance by plants like the eucalypts and the melaleucas. And you can see the flowers in Florida, you know, the melaleuca flowers, birds like them, but they're big brushes. So you don't need a little tiny um, hummingbird's bill to get to the nectar. Uh, something, a quite large bird can do it. Uh, you would also know that hummingbirds are quite aggressive. They can fight at flowers. And so we have birds that you're not constrained by the little teeny flowers to be small. They evolve into much bigger birds, and that aggression is really intense. And so we have two exceptionally aggressive birds and noisy miners. These are the birds dominate all around my garden, my whole city. It's just noisy minor land. And you can see the language used about them in in these journal articles, a despotic, high impact species, uh, hyper aggressive behavior, indiscriminate and specific aggression. So these birds, they form big social colonies that drive away all unusual birds. Um, and they'll drive away, they'll attack lizards, possums, dogs, sometimes people. Um, and they're, they're a very good warning system. So I always know if there's a falcon flying around, uh, or if there's a snake and, and individual calls, I can think, well, that's a very unusual, noisy minor call. I think there's a snake outside. But yeah, there's noisy miners and magpies. I think each in their own way, uh, they just win, win global competitions for aggression. Um, now we also have, instead of aphids, we have these little psyllid bugs. Uh, these have now reached um, America. So they're in Hawaii, California, they're in Southern Florida. And these are incredibly important resource for birds because a little tiny insect um, it uses excess sap to create this little sugary cover. It hides under that. And this is sweet. It's got calories, so birds love to eat it. Um, and American birds just love lurk. I'm, I'm write about that in my book about seeing, um, just looking at eucalypts and seeing birds come to take, uh, just birds like warblers and um, juncos. And we have... Uh, bellbirds that are lurk specialists. So these are closely related to the noisy miners, similar level of aggression. They're so good at driving away other birds from their lurk resources. 
that the alert concentrations build up so high that the trees die. The trees die from insect attack. This is a major, major problem. It's been talked about as a kind of farming because the, um, the, um, some of the time when the bellbirds are taking alert, they're very careful not to hurt the insect. So it's described as like, like shearing a sheep, take the cover off the sheep, but you keep the sheep. And so it's been talked about as unsustainable, unsustainable farming in birds. And yeah, we just have these very ecologically powerful birds you know, responsible for tree death over I mean, a lot of um, forestry plantations. They've, they've just walked away from them. Um, okay, enough about songbirds. Now, if we turn to parrots, I mean, they're another obvious example to look at for Gondwana and origin because South America and Australia are your two parrot-rich continents. South America's got a lot more parrots than we have, but there's much greater genetic diversity in Australia. So cockatoos, are, you know, they really stand apart from other, other parrots. And then there are these New Zealand kias, kakas and kakapolas, which are, once again, a very different group. And so the DNA evidence has converged on uh, origin for parrots in the southern in the southern hemisphere and the pattern that's accepted is that they evolved in Australia one group traveled through Antarctica before it <clears throat> turned to ice radiated in South America so when, when there was the three continents were still joined together and then other parrots left out of Australia to populate the rest of the world and you know it's it's great living in a land of parrots and you look at that Black cockatoo on the left, I mean, that is so much a monkey or a squirrel holding onto a nut to eat the seeds. I mean, this is the ecological analog of a mammal. And the cockatoo on the right, I mean, that is one of your big woodpeckers getting a grub out of the tree, but wow, what a mess they make. And so um, if that was a woodpecker, that would be helping the tree. That would be a surgical hole, tease the grub out. But instead, it's ruined the tree. That, that tree may not recover. It's probably going to blow over. Now, my partner and I have got a bush property, and we've realised over the years that the black cockatoos, they're hitting most of our gum trees and just making a terrible mess of them. But the trees are adapted to it. So that tree that was totally decapitated on the left to get one of those witchetty grubs, it's now looks like a normal tree again. They just re-sprouted multiple shoots, and one of them thickened up and took over. The others withered away. So that's fantastic. It's such an old system that um, life goes on. Now, um, we accept that parrots originated in Australia on DNA evidence. Fossils don't actually match that, but no one is contesting it because these amazingly sophisticated DNA studies are actually saying that perching birds and parrots are each other's closest relatives. So, um, you know, you've got the most intelligent birds in those two groups and they are closely related to each other. You cannot tell that from anatomy. I mean, if you hold a parrot and a perching bird, there's nothing you can look at if feet are different. There's nothing to tell you that they are related. But the DNA evidence is really strong. And the fossil record is also strong because there are all sorts of fossils, these little zygodactyl birds that are a mixture of parrot and songbird features. So if you look at that phylogenetic tree, if you start at the top, there's the three branches of the perching birds. Then you see parrots as the next branch. Then you get falcons. So falcons uh, are centred in South America. It's where you've got the uh, caracaras centred there. That's a falcon subfamily and the forest falcon. So three subfamilies of falcons in South America, only one subfamily anywhere else. And then the next branch you get are the Seriamas, only in South America. So that whole top clade of birds, that's got Gondwana written all over it. Um, so yeah, this is pretty good stuff. Pigeons, um, pigeons are another Gondwana group. The oldest branch is um, South American. So I won't try and suggest that pigeons come from Australia, um, but some pigeons, leave Australia. So we have phylogenetic trees. I mean, you're probably aware that the DNA says that the dodo is a, is a giant pigeon. Um, and if 
they, they took some DNA off a dodo specimen in the museum and it grouped in with all these pigeons around New Guinea, southern Indonesia, which grouped in with pigeons in Australia. So um, I talk about in my bird book, hey, you know, the dodo, dodo only existed because a, a pigeon flew, flew out of Australia. Um, now this southern origin thing, I mean, people have taken it much further than me. So after my book came out, um, Santiago Claremont and Joel Craycraft at the American Museum of Natural History, they brought out this paper saying that all birds originated in South America. Um, uh, it was quite a speculative paper. Um, and I thought, you can't, you can't really say that. The fossil and DNA evidence isn't good enough. So what they were saying is that, yes, songbirds colonised um, Australia from, um, from Australia, but that their ancestors moved from South America through Antarctica into Australia rather than happening the other way around. Um, but this, this paper was, was soon attacked by um, fossil people, um, by Gerald Meyer in Germany and by others. It hasn't, it hasn't really taken off. And so I think that you will, you can find this um, talked about. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't actually contradict with my book, um, except at the very early level of where, the, where songbirds started. Um, um, but, but also I think that it's not, it's not consensus science. So yeah, I think that over my lifetime, we've come a huge way from this idea of Australia just being this weird land of strange creatures. And it was, the real barrier to accepting the DNA evidence was just that <clears throat> when the Northern Hemisphere is so big and Australia is so small, the idea of Australia having a group of species that then colonises the world, that was very counterintuitive. Now you had Charles Darwin saying that large land masses are, are the centre of evolution because um, there's more competition there, there's larger populations of animals, therefore evolution advances further. Fair enough. But we now have evidence from a lot of bird families, uh, insects like cicadas. Uh, there's evidence of a lot of um, groups coming out of Australia. Not, not trying to say that Australia is more important than other countries, just that evolution has been very decentralised. And for some, I don't know why, uh, songbirds and um, parrots should come out of Australia. I don't offer any um, evolutionary or environmental explanation, but it just so happened. So I want to thank people for photos. And um, there's, there's my book, The American Edition, and that was my talk. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. That, that was fascinating. And it's just so... Um, Tim, it just feels so different from how we are here. I mean, it sounds like you have to be careful going out your front door in the spring, in, in the Australian spring, but maybe I'm over-exaggerating that, but it sounds quite daunting with the magpies. Yeah, usually usually they don't. Um, it, it's not common for the first strike to draw blood, so usually you get a snap within like one or two, one or two inches of your ear or your neck. And when you're used to it, you go, oh, that was a magpie. So then you kind of look around. So it'll do that and fly up to a tree. And then if you act very um, submissive, like, you know, you lower your head and quickly move under a tree then, and get away from there, you're okay. I mean, it definitely affects bird watching with the miners because you'll pull up at the side of the road thinking, oh, this will be good for birds. But if you hear noisy miners or bellbird, you go, ah, this is not going to be any good for bird watching. You just drive off somewhere else. And cassowaries are very dangerous, right? With that kind of like helmet bone on top of their head, they could clobber you and kill you, right? I, it's, it's actually the feet that they use. So they, they disembowel oh. you. It's a long toe, the middle toe. But um, they have a really strongly associate people with food. So um, if, they, if they approach you, it's more likely that they want food. Um, but yeah, there are these, uh, there are these aggressive encounters and because they're a, an endangered bird in North Queensland, the National Parks Department, they put a lot of effort into human cassowary relationships. So any hint of an aggressive bird, they're out there interviewing people, putting up signs. So there's a really, um, I mean, I talked to one 
friend of mine who was a national parks ranger and he said, what if a cassowary pecked a baby in a pram? I mean, if that, if a baby was killed by a cassowary, the negative media that, you know, that could just undo so much in terms of human tolerance for cassowaries. So they put a lot of resources into um, trying to make sure conflicts don't happen. Wow, it's fascinating. Um, somebody asked, uh, and I think you've just uh, confirmed this, but uh, to double check, um, that the magpies are aggressive during breeding season, is that correct? And not, ne yeah, not that's necessarily right. otherwise? That's right. And so you, you tend to forget about them for most of the year, and then you get that click in the year, and you, oh, yeah, it's spring. Where, where are the magpie nests this year? And it could, it could be in the same same tree, but it could be in a different tree. So, yeah, you know, people, pick, I mean, it's, it's mainly an issue for families with kids and they will avoid certain areas of parks. But as I say, the, the city council here, they've got these little cheap plastic signs and they just stick them up. And so there's about four signs that I can see outside my house um, to warn people. Wow. Someone else wanted to know where do kiwis and the terrestrial parrots fit into the orders? Um, so if you're talking about terrestrial, I mean, terrestrial parrots isn't a category. Um, New Zealand's got the kakapo, that is a terrestrial, well, I suppose that is the most ground dwelling parrot. That's in the oldest group of parrots. So kakapo it fits in with the kias, which do a lot of feeding on the ground, and kakapoas, which are a tree dwelling parrot. Um, so they are very, very, um, well, they're the oldest branch of parrots. And they're a really important reason why you shouldn't talk use the word primitive, because you may have heard about the research on the intelligence of kias, incredibly, incredibly intelligent birds in terms of problem solving. They have, have I think it's in Austria, they keep them a captive colony in some behavioral lab just for research into intelligence. Kiwis fit in with the, the ratites, so um, they're related. I can't remember what their closest relatives are, but they're, they're fit in. I think, I think it might be Australian emus and cassowaries, but one of the the giant southern flightless birds. Wow. It's a whole different world, it sounds like. I've never been to Australia, but it certainly sounds that way. It, it's really rowdy. So um, you don't get a good spring chorus because we've got so much, so many parrots and they are raucous. And because we have so many noisy miners, another really large, we've got more large songbirds. And you'd know that like crows and ravens and jays, that they're not musical. So um, once you get a lot of large songbirds and a lot of parrots, it's really harsh acoustics. But you also get beautiful songsters like the lyrebirds and the whistlers. So, yeah, I think we're really acoustically diverse. And that's really, really fun. Jean, Jean wanted to ask a question. Um, I have a more general question, Tim. It's, it's about migration in Australia. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with, with it in detail. So if you could give us some rough idea about migration patterns. Um, yeah, it's quite variable. So we get a fair, fair number of north-south migrants. So virtually all our waders fly up to Siberia. And we've got terns doing that. Uh, we've got some other, we've got a lot of northward migration by fruit eating birds. We've got quite a number of birds that fly north into New Guinea. Some go further, um, like common forest kingfishers, I some, sometimes hear out here, they'll go to southern Indonesia. Um, um, and there's a, there's a lot of nomadic movements. So um, during drought periods, a lot of inland birds will come to the coast. Um, we've got migratory parrots. So in um, Tasmania, there are two species of parrot that are flying across the sea to the mainland. Yeah, but but I, yeah, I'm mean, Yeah, if I get back to that, when Cornell um, Lab invited me to give a talk, that was really nice. They invited me just in the very week that the first warblers were flying back, and so I went out with one of the brilliant local ornithologists and. Um, you know, it was just wonderful. And he's saying, oh, you know, this warbler, they would have just turned up this week and this one, this one. And it was all tweety, tweety, tweety to me. And I'm thinking, this so narrow acoustically for me. It was only when you heard a crow, something, you know, something really large that I, 
but, but yeah, you, we don't, just don't have that migration of a lot of small songbirds and all this spring tweety, tweety, tweety. We, we really don't have that. <laughs> yes, I had that sense that, that, that uh, I, I think you have many more birds in Australia that don't migrate or certainly. That's stay, right. Yeah, than, than we do here, yeah. Yeah, well, it's just not that cold. You know, if you go to um, uh, Tasmania, uh, most of the birds, you know, that's the bottom of Australia, um, most of the birds are still there in winter. It's only a small mm -hmm. subset of birds. So, you know, we, we don't have anything like Canada or, or, or New York State where they were, those winters, they're, they're extremely cold. And I, mean, I had the experience of flying from Melbourne, well, um, flying to Seoul, you know, the, the capital of South Korea. That's on the same latitude as um, Melbourne. And there's snow and people spat on the sidewalk and they're frozen. I mean, you never have snow in Melbourne. It's, it's warm, <laughs> it's balmy. So, yeah, the Northern Hemisphere is much colder. Yeah, yeah. yeah very interesting. So. so you mentioned Gondawanda land a number of times. Um, where was it and when was it? it? It's I sort of picture it reaching what Australia and Southeast Asia and Africa and South America, but I don't know. Yeah, okay. Well, it's, I'd like, I'll, I'll talk backwards. So if you go back 80, say 85 million years, you had the, the real core of it, the real, in terms of birds, the part that matters was South America, Antarctica, and Australia. So those three formed the real core. So if you go back earlier in time, you had India and Africa, but Africa left so early, it had no relevance to birds. So by the time Africa left, it's more like dinosaurs, not, well, not, not birds. But yeah, um, and the break, the break between Australia and Antarctica and um, South America and um, uh, Antarctica happened roughly the same time. And that Antarctica used to be a wonderful place. You know, we know from fossils it had rainforests. Mm. It, it had to have been rich in parrots and it had marsupials. We, we know all that because, I mean, platypus fossils have been found in South America. So, we know, there were platypuses. Um, but when you had that breakage between Australia and South America, there would have been bird migration between Australia and Antarctica when it was still green. But when those two continents moved north a certain distance. Because the planet is spinning, you had water started spinning around Antarctica, going in a circle. And what keeps the Southern Hemisphere warmer than the North is that equatorial water. It flows down the sides of South America, Africa. It flows south around continents, and so it warms up the Southern Oceans around Australia. But that warm water, it doesn't get down to Antarctica because you've got the circumpolar current so that water's going around in a circle around Antarctica. And then when that current set in, Antarctica just froze over. And it was a huge catastrophe. There's so much yeah. wildlife would have been lost. And that really closed off Antarctica as a pathway between Australia and South America. And, you know, it may not be that it was that long ago that Australia, I mean, uh, Antarctica was green. They've actually found very old copies of extremely old maps that show uh you know rivers and towns and all kinds of things in in antarctica and of course there may be pole shifts too all kinds of things to add to our our mystery and de or deciphering of all of the the birds and dna and where they all go from and come to fascinating yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, not aware of any old humans in Antarctica. I mean, the, the youngest fossils uh, are a few million years old. I can't, I can't remember the date now. But, um, yeah, there was one part on the one edge of Antarctica that stayed, stayed warm and wetter. Um, I think it was, um, yeah, a few million years ago, but um, I can't remember. Um, Michelle Reed asks, uh, do you have any recommendations of organizations for bird lovers in Brisbane similar to the Audubon Society? I'll be there from February to July, so I would love this. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's Birds Queensland, so um, that's the main group. Um, 
yeah, no, they're a good, they're, you'd recognize them. So, um, you know, the equivalent of, a, of an Audubon group in America. Not, not that I've had a huge lot to do with Audubon groups in the US. So that was yeah. birds, birds of Queensland? They were just called Birds Queensland, yeah. Birds I, think, I think they've got a lot. Yeah, it used to be the Queensland Ornithological Society, but it's this trend to shortening names. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions? It doesn't look like it. Well, I have one more question. Um, I, I think I understood, um, Tim, from you in passing, that lyre birds may be the most beautiful songbirds. Yeah, so I mean, um, both beautiful singing song, the songs yeah. they sing. Yeah, I, I think that there's no. I'm not sure if there's any way to answer that objectively. So you know, like, yeah. because it is, you know, it's up to who's the best painter, you know, who's the best actor. Right. It does come. <laughs> down to individual judgment. But um, I think, you know, David Attenborough's, um, uh, you know, when he did his bird series, you know, he, he introduces the nightingale and says, this is a great song, but now listen to a lyre bird. And I think that if you, you know, it's very easy to get online calls on Xena Canto. And I've done this, you know, if you play a nightingale, uh, you can say, oh, that that is really, really good. But then when you play uh, a lyre bird, you think, no, that was like the nine girl was like the, the warm up act. This is this is the main act, and and yeah, I would defy anyone to say that any bird can outdo a, a live bird. And I've never heard anyone suggest any other candidate. So yeah, I'll say they are by popular acclaim the world's Great. best songbirds. And yeah, I'd invite anyone just to. You, you've inspired me, and when we finish the talk, I'm going to have to go listen to some lyre birds on video. <laughs> and, and if you come to Australia. I mean, the, um, there's a place, Green, Green Mountains, it's O'Reilly's guest house. Over the years, the lyrebirds there have become tame to a degree that is totally, totally ridiculous. So the last time I was there, I was just standing a few yards away from a lyrebird. I mean, it wasn't calling, it was just scratching and feeding. They won't call right beside you, but... Um, they've walked inside the main tourist buildings there, so where people are taking bookings, they had a lyre bird walk inside. So they're incredibly easy to see at that one location. Um, but then they're, they're not, we've got two species, and it's the, the other one is a slightly better, I think, in terms of its songs, but you can easily hear them because they, they call for most of the year, but more so in the colder months. The other thing is... Um... Kookaburras, those are birds too, right? It shows how little I... Yeah, yeah, they're, they're really um, part of the um, cacophony, the really discordant call. So they're the world's biggest um, kingfishers. And I really wanted to make a big deal of them in the book because you know, Australia's got the world's biggest kingfishers, but they're not. There's nothing gone to on about them. It's all their relatives, all, all the groups that are related to kookaburras are in Africa and Asia. So they've come into Australia and done... Or, you know, kingfishers have come into Australia and done really well here. Oh, wow. Excellent. This is Excellent. fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, and and thank you coming from for being so... Um, when I contacted you right away, you, you were excited to speak to us. And it's taken a while between our schedules yes. and yours. But I thank you so much. It's just great to have you all the way from Australia. And please take good care of the birds for the whole planet. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah, you, great. Tim. Great Thank you, Tim. You A uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. Can't wait to get to Australia now. Right. So um, I would just like to say that um, next month we have another fascinating and um, it, it, I couldn't believe this when I first read about this. Um, uh, on February 13th, somebody will be, Dan Dr. Danielle Whitaker will be talking about avian scent. And it's like, what? Apparently, the latest research is that um, it, it may be uh, that birds not only smell, but the, their sense, their ability to smell may be the secret to their world. So uh, please, please come. And this is will be um, a woman who's written a book called Avian Scent, The Secret Perfume of Birds. And she's going to talk about her research and, 
and a new book. And she was really excited to come and talk to us all. She, I didn't have to persuade her. It was like, boom, and she, she was ready to come. So please oh, join us great. next month. Look right. forward to that. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Margie. Thank you, Karen. We'll um, see you, see you next. See you next. Yep. Yep. Bye, everybody. Good.